Shalom, Shalom. All praise, glory, and honor be unto Yahweh, Bahasham, Yahweh Shai, Bahasham, Rachakwadash. Peace and double honor to the apostles and elders of Great Millstone. Shalom unto the elect. So I wanted to go into this lesson. I had been doing some studying going into Isaiah around the 40th chapter on. And I came across, I believe it's the 44th chapter, going into the 45th chapter. And I was reading some uh, commentaries and different things uh, pertaining to the prophecy of Cyrus, Cyrus the Great of Persia. Okay, and uh, I, I did some research about it because when you read into certain of these scholars, which shows you that you have to, you know, vet and you can't take everything at face value when it comes to what the scholars say, because a lot of times they go the hell off, too. All right. So I was going in and seeing what they were mentioning, and they mentioned that, uh, you know, the Isaiah prophecy of Cyrus the Great, that that was added in later when Cyrus was alive, which obviously didn't make any sense because we know that the book of Isaiah is the book of Isaiah. So they like to throw in doubt upon the scripture because Isaiah prophesied of Cyrus over a hundred years before he was even born by name. All right. Mentioned by name. Okay. So you know what? How are we going to do it? We're just going to go right to the scripture. I'm going to get that precept and uh, a few other precepts pertaining to it. And I found an interesting uh, commentary online pretty much proving that this this was written by the prophet Isaiah through the spirit of the Lord. All right. But let's grab this right now. Isaiah 44 and. Let's see. Let's read uh, Isaiah 44 and 28. That saith, or I'll read it in the NLT. When I say of Cyrus, he is my shepherd. He will certainly do as I say. He will command, rebuild Jerusalem. He will stay, restore the temple. We know that there was a decree by Cyrus the Great of Persia okay, in his time, okay, which was around... If I'm not mistaken, you know what? Let's just grab it so I don't uh, miss uh, misquote it. Right. So right here it says Cyrus the Great, King of Persia. Okay. It says Cyrus the Great it is approximately he they approximated his birth from 590 to 580 BCE. Okay. Cyrus the Great, Media or Persis now in Iran. Died 529 BC, was a conqueror who founded the Achaemenian Empire, centered on Persia and comprising the Near East from the Aegean Sea eastward to the Indus River. He is also remembered in the Cyrus legend, first recorded by Xenophon, Greek soldier and author in his Cyropedia, as a tolerant and ideal monarch who was called the father of his people by the ancient Persians. In the Bible, he is the liberator of the Jews, okay, who were captive in Babylonia. So the Lord set this man up, and he is a biblical figure, and it's known, all right? There's a lot of proof, okay, that he existed, okay? He's not just some made-up man, okay? Greek historian Herodotus mentioned him, all right? So a lot of historians throughout history have mentioned him. But these scholars, the first time that uh, Cyrus is mentioned is through the spirit of the Lord by the prophet Isaiah. OK, now, real quick, we're going to look into when did Isaiah, when was Isaiah's time? So obviously take the image here, <laughs> blasphemous image. All right. Isaiah was a so-called black man. OK, Isaiah was not a leprous demon. OK, like this depiction here. Because to have that skin color, to have no pigment, is a curse of leprosy. So the Lord did not make his people to have that curse. Okay? As a matter of fact, I'm going to grab a quick precept pertaining to that. Because again, these scholars, man, these are the same scholars that have pushed this nonsense narrative. So we have to correct 
all these things. Exodus 4 and 6. And Yahweh said furthermore unto him, Put now thine hand into thy bosom. And he put his hand into his bosom. And when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous as snow. So Moses put his hand into his bosom. And if his hand became leprous as snow, that means the rest of his flesh was the opposite of that, which would be dark. Okay? Because why would it be remarkable for him to put his hand in and it become, become leprous as snow? Okay? So it means what? He lost the pigment. And you have a lot of uh, so-called black people and even brown people that have that leprosy. Like you'll see certain parts of their skin, um, the melanin is not there. Okay? So that's a curse. So the Lord didn't didn't make his people to have that curse. It says, and he said, put thine hand into thy bosom again. And he put his hand into his bosom again and plucked it out of his bosom. And behold, it was turned again as his other flesh. Okay, so what was his other flesh color then? If it wasn't the color of snow, it had to be what? Dark, brown, okay, which is a normal appearance. All right, just to prove that. So um, going into Isaiah, okay, it mentions what the point being was the eighth century BC Israelite prophet after whom the book of Isaiah is named. Okay. Okay, so it says the text of the book of Isaiah refers to Isaiah as the prophet, but the exact relationship between the book of Isaiah and the actual prophet Isaiah is complicated. See, but this, but it's not complicated. <laughs> but these devils, they like to throw shade. That's why whenever you go to these Wikipedias, you got to take them with a grain of salt because they're always going to cast doubt on the Holy Scriptures. All right. As though they were there and they know exactly what happened. OK, but it says the traditional view is that all 66 chapters of the book of Isaiah were written by one man, Isaiah, possibly in two periods between 740 B.C. and 686 B.C. Separated by approximately 15 years. Now, here they go. OK, here they go with this completely unfounded claim, completely unfounded. And um, we're going to prove that it's unfounded because the Lord himself. Quoted Isaiah from chapters beyond the 39th chapter. OK, but they like to cast doubt. Why? Because if indeed Isaiah did write all the all, all the chapters all the way from one to, to 66, that would prove that. The prophecy about Cyrus and Isaiah 44 going into 45 is, is a miracle. That's a prophecy that came to pass because the Lord mentioned Cyrus by name and he actually was born over 100 years later and did exactly what he was prophesied to do. So so Jake back then, the southern kingdom could look into what Isaiah said and say, wow, this was proven. This is a proven prophecy that the Lord mentioned. So when Cyrus made that decree, they knew that they that that it was time to go back to the land because a lot of them were settled, well settled in in Babylon. You know, they had a cushy life, so to speak, you know. But again, reading here, it says another widely held view, now, widely held by by who? <laughs> by a few devil scholars, man. All right. And some fools that probably went to the seminary school. This is why you can't get too deep into these commentaries. Now, you can read them, but we have to read them with discernment through the Rakakwadash. Wadash. All right. Because they go off. Another widely held view suggests that parts of the first half of the book, chapters one through thirty nine, originated with the historical prophet interspersed with prose commentary written in the time of King Josiah 100 years later, and that the remainder of the book dates from immediately before and immediately after the end of of the 6th century BC in exile in Babylon. Okay. Now, why do they do this? Because they they want to cast doubt because again, if if Isaiah wrote the whole thing, which we know he did, then that would mean the Lord that that would show the power of the Lord by declaring a king a hundred, over 150 years before he was even born. All right? Because as we read, Cyrus Cyrus was born around 590 to 580 BC. Okay, and Isaiah prophesied between 740 BC and 686 BC. So that's way before Cyrus was even born. Okay. So now we can go back. I want to go back to the precept. All right. Of Isaiah. We're going to read it. And then we're going to get into this commentary, this other 
Uh, well, it's more of like a comment that I read on the forum, but whoever wrote it actually knew what they were talking about. Isaiah 45 and 1, thus saith Yahweh to his anointed, to Cyrus. He's the only heathen king that's referred to that way. Okay. Whose right hand I have holden to subdue nations before him. And I will loose the loins of kings to open before him the two leave the gates and the gates shall not be shut. Right. So in other words, the Lord is setting up Cyrus and is going to make everything. He may pretty much make him prosperous. All right. He's going to make other kings bow before him and pretty much subdue other nations around him. So that what? All right. So that we're going to jump, jump straight down to the fourth verse. It says, for Jacob, my servant's sake, and Israel, mine elect. So that's the reason why Cyrus was set up in power. It says, I have even called thee by thy name. I have surnamed thee, though thou hast not known me. Okay. So the Lord is saying that he's the one that declared this. So the scholars that are saying that, um, the, the scholars that are saying that, oh, well, you know, Isaiah didn't really write this. It was added in later around. It. They're basically saying that when Cyrus already came into power, they put this in to make it seem like it was a prophecy. So they're basically calling the Lord a liar. And they're, you know, without saying it directly, they're saying that the Bible is a lie. OK, which we know that's not the case, because what does the scripture say? The Lord is not a man that he should lie. Not a man that, let's see. No, that's not it. Let's see. Yep, Numbers 23 and 19. God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken and shall he not make it good? Okay, so the Lord said that. Okay, the Lord is not a man that he should lie. All right. His word goes and accomplishes what it's set out to do. So if he sets up a king and that, and that shows the, pro the prophecies, if there's prophecies already in the Bible that the Lord declared and have come to pass, what does that mean? That means that all of the prophecies are going to come to pass. OK, look at this right in the same chapter, Isaiah 45 and 21. Tell ye and bring them near. Yea, let them take counsel together. Who hath declared this from ancient time? Who hath told it from that time? Have not I, Yahweh, and there is no power else beside me, a just God and a Savior? There is none beside me. You see, so the Lord is saying that the only way to salvation is through him. Yahweh, Bahashem, Yahweh Shai. And the Heavenly Father set up his son to be our Savior. Okay, so... The point being, though, the Lord declares things from ancient times and he had to do it because, well, it's, it's his will at the end of the day. But one of the reasons why is because Jake would say that they one of their idols did it. And this idol did it. See, this idol declared it. But the Lord declared it through his prophets so that when it happened, they could know that it's Yahweh Yah that did it. All right. So I want to go back into the, uh, the commentary. Or the, the comment that was on that forum. All right, boom. Okay, so. So um, when you go up to the top here, it mentions, all right, is there any evidence that the book of Isaiah was written before Cyrus? So plenty of people come and say, oh, the same old tired argument that, oh, it was added on later. This 44 and 45th chapters are mentioned. They call it Deutero Isaiah. This devil just be making up words, man, <laughs> you know, making up different terms and different bull crap. And a lot of these people eat it up because he because Esau is looked at as the as the light. Esau is looked at as the one that he's the one that has the information and the knowledge because they're in power. But this man is a liar. OK, he's a deceiver. All right. So let's get right into it. I'm not going to read this whole thing. I mean, I could drop the, the link in the description. But I'm going to kind of like skip around a bit, but there's a lot of good information here. 
But this guy basically defends the fact that the, uh, the, the book of Isaiah is completely written by Isaiah. This wasn't added later on. You know, 40th chapter on wasn't just added later on. All right. But it says here there are three items in Isaiah 21, which give clues as to when it was written in the in that in the year that Tartan came unto Ashdod, when Sargon, the king of Assyria, sent him and fought against Ashdod and took it. The use of the term Tartan shows at least this section of Isaiah was written early prior to 600 B.C. because 600 B.C. is around the time of Cyrus. So they're showing you this is proof that the book of Isaiah was written before. Tartan was a military term in the Assyrian army and was the highest position in the army under the king himself. Basically, uh, an Assyrian term for a commander. All right. So and uh, this is verified. OK, when you look into it. Isaiah 20 and one. OK, when you go into the word there for Tartan. In the Hebrew, it is Thar. Tar, Tartan, Tartaran. Or no, it's uh, Taratan or Tartan. OK, Tartan, Field Marshal, General or Commander, a title used by the Assyrian military. So showing you that is a term from the time of the Assyrian Empire. OK, so it wouldn't have been used during the time of um, Cyrus. Okay, Tartan was a military term in the Assyrian army, was the highest position in the army under the king himself. There would typically, typically be one Tartan controlling the left side of the battlefield and another controlling the right side and the king controlling the middle deployment. The Assyrian army ceased to exist when the Assyrian arm empire ceased in 609 BC when it was destroyed by the Babylonians. The language fell into decay and its military terms would have fallen more quickly into oblivion, seeing as there was no longer an Assyrian army after 609 BC. As another contributor has already said, the mention of the Assyrian king Sargon is also witnessed that Isaiah 1 through 39 was written early because Sargon was unknown to history, including Herodotus, until his palace was discovered in the 19th century. The historian Herodotus does mention one of the attacks of Sennacherib as it affected Egypt. Sennacherib was the king after Sargon, but he nowhere mentions Sargon. This Sargon is not to be confused with Sargon the Great, who was many centuries later. Okay, so... He goes on and on, basically proving um, proving that um, the first 39 chapters are were written in during that time. All right. Which dates back to what we read, what we read about, which was the time of Isaiah. All right. Which was way before 600 B.C. All right. So then he mentions Isaiah 45, which um, we mentioned Isaiah 45 and four again for the sake of my servant Jacob and Israel, my chosen. I call you by your name. I name you, though you do not know me. All right. So cynics claim this section must have been written when Cyrus has become king of Persia or around that time or afterwards. And that the Jews have dishonestly pretended that this is prophecy when it in fact it wasn't. So they claim chapters 40 to the end were written later than 1 through 39. And these are the same carnal men that do not believe in a lot of portions of the scriptures. But yet they claim to be historians and scholars and all into it. But you have to understand these scriptures through faith. Okay. And faith is a gift. Let's grab that. In Ephesians. We believe in these things through faith. And there is a lot of... Um, Proof you can get carnal proof, historical proof, archaeological proof, but yet it's all about faith when it comes down to it. As Ephesians 2 and 8, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of the Most High. Yahweh by Hashem, Yahweh Shai. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Right? So this is all a gift that was given to us. All right, so we don't have nothing to boast about. Okay, but these men they glorify their own wisdom. Okay, they 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 proclaim themselves to be wise. One problem with this is the sins which are so vigorously condemned in 40 through 66 are the sins of the pre-captivity, i.e. the sins before going into exile in Babylon. They are the sins of Israel and Judah prior to the destruction of the northern tribes, which we know is the so-called Latino and Native American tribes that came to America during uh, around the time of the Assyrian captivity. All right. And Judah prior to the destruction of Judah in the early 500s. BC. 
For instance, idolatry is condemned and the burning of their own children to Molech is condemned in chapter 57. These sins did not happen after the return from captivity. They are exclusively the sins of the pre-captivity. After the captivity, the Jews were exceedingly careful not to worship the idols of the surrounding nations. Right, because they got a foot in their ass. So Jake knew, all right, we see the result of us following after these idols. So let's let's stop. All right. Now, it was still going on to an extent, but it was a lot less after the captivity than before. OK. So then he goes on to explain. That the people that are, you know, basically cynical, you know, they don't believe in the they don't believe um, that. It's possible for because it would be miraculous. All right. So, you know, he goes into the problems with people that don't believe. OK, so it says, but well, there are serious problems with this view that some anonymous prophets were involved in the production of the final book of Isaiah. Right. So somebody random just popped up, wrote something down, you know, all these heavy prophecies, prophecies about the Lord and the Lord himself quoted Isaiah. So for you to say that Isaiah 40 through 66 was not written by Isaiah, you're saying the Lord, who you call Christ, his real name is Yahweh Shai. You're saying he's a liar. You see, so there's going to be a heavy judgment. OK, below is a list of all the prophetic books of the Old Testament, which the author is anonymous list. This is none. All right. So basically there there are none. There are no Old Testament books where this is an anonymous author. All right. <clears throat> They're named after the men that wrote them. It only speaks of true pro prophets and false prophets. The Old Testament knows nothing of anonymous prophets. Every book of prophecy in the Old Testament has the name of the prophet who gave it. Hey, particularly interesting is the vision of Obadiah. Okay. So Ob Obadiah, we know, goes into the, the downfall of Edom. Okay. So I, I wanted to jump down a bit. Yeah, check this out. All right. It says, though many readers might not value its witness, the New Testament in many places attributes the whole of the book of Isaiah to the prophet Isaiah. The people who wrote the New Testament saw Isaiah as one book. An interesting passage is John 12 through 38, 12, 38 through 40. That the saying of Isaiah, the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spake, Lord, who hath believed our report and to whom? Half the arm of the Lord been revealed. Therefore, they could not believe because that Isaiah said again, he hath blinded their eyes. <laughs> he hath blinded their eyes and hardened their heart that they should not see with their eyes nor understand with their heart and be converted and I should heal them. So, again, just to show it in the in the scriptures, all right, John 12 and 80 and 38, okay, all right, John 12 and 37, but though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him, and then he goes on to mention, all right, well, it goes on to mention that what, that the saying of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, so why would it say here that it was a, a saying of Isaiah, of Isaiah the prophet OK, if Isaiah didn't actually write it. So you're saying that the Lord is a liar. OK, and that's why there's going to be a judgment for those that, that a lot of these scholars, you know, a lot of them go off. All right. I'll say most of them, pretty much all of them go off in one way, shape or form or another. All right. There's some things they get right. But all of them, because they don't have the Holy Spirit, they go off. So, you know, the point of the point is lesson being that you got to read these commentaries with faith and also discernment because guys like Sakari, they'll see a, a scholar say that, oh, Isaiah wasn't really written by Isaiah all the way. And, and they'll actually take that to the congregation and run with it. I'm not saying that th with this particular situation, but they've in the past, they've followed the scholars to their own foolishness and destruction. All right. And their own transgression against the doctrine. OK, it says in this passage, the first quote is from Isaiah 53 and one. The second is from Isaiah six and ten. And the third is from Isaiah six and one. For 53 and one, the author of John's gospel tells us that it was that which Isaiah spake. OK. 
So that's proof. Okay, and in fact, we must doubt. It says, so if we do not believe that the same author wrote both 1 through 39 and 40 through 66, then we have to doubt also this passage in the New Testament. And in fact, we must doubt most of the passages in the New Testament, which refer to the book of Isaiah, which most of them refer to that which Isaiah spoke. Okay, so the, you know, Isaiah is amongst, if not the most quoted prophet that the Lord mentioned, that's mentioned in the Gospels. All right. It is peculiar that anyone living in our century should think the name Cyrus could not have been written 700 BC, but must have been written after he became king of Persia. Why? Because Isaiah 40 and 66 contains chapter 53, one of the most breathtaking prophecies in the whole of the Old Testament. Obviously, chapter 53 truly predicts the future because we have it preserved in the great Isaiah scroll of the Dead Sea Scrolls, which we know was written at least a, a century and a half before the beginning of Christ's ministry, which is his real name is Yahweh Shai. So even uh, the old, you know, this uh, the proof that they found in scroll shows that this was written before. All right. So because, again, this this type of logic that these scholars have, they'll keep attributing prophecies to oh well somebody added it later after it already happened because isaiah 53 is about the lord the prophecy about the lord so they're telling you this dude is telling you now that that isaiah scroll which was found it's again we believe all this through faith but we can go and actually you know the lord puts the spirit on us to search these things out and the scripture does say it's prove all things okay so we can go into these type of different proofs to further bolster the 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 argument here the knowledge all right what we already know okay so they can't sit here and say well Isaiah 53 was added later on because uh you know in this in the year uh 200 AD after the Lord was born it was uh you know they'll make some shit up pull it out their ass pretty much to cast doubt okay they even try to shine a, a positive light on like on Herod <laughs> they say that he never killed the uh, infants in Bethlehem when the scriptures clearly says it Okay, because they'll go to every other, they'll go to outside sources and all this bullshit, but we know the ultimate source of knowledge and wisdom and understanding is the Holy Bible. Okay, and there's historical figures in the Bible, which Cyrus is one of them, that proves that the Holy Scriptures are real. All right, and this is a historical book, as well as a book of prophecy, wisdom, exhortation, instruction, all right, many different things. Okay. <laughs> The scriptures is like a panacea, a cure-all, all right? Okay? So the proof we have that chapter 53 is a true prophecy of the future should enable us to believe the name Cyrus was announced before he was born. Right, so he's saying if Isaiah 53 mentioned the Lord, okay, way before, um, way before the Lord, and that was, that was an even bigger period of time, right? That was centuries and centuries. Okay, why should it be so hard to believe that the Lord named Cyrus before he was born. Yep, it says, interesting. interestingly, the great Isaiah scroll has no gap in the scroll between the end of chapter 39 and the start of chapter 40. You can see the original scroll online here. So when you go into this original scroll, you'll see that there was no separation. It was all one book. Okay? The idea of multiple authors of Isaiah began with Johann Doderlin, professor of theology at Jenna. So, so some demon... <laughs> Some Edomite devil. This is where this shit originates. All right. Just like all of these false doctrines and bullshit that Jake believes in. When you go into it, it's some devil sitting behind the curtain like the Wizard of Oz pulling the strings. OK. So, um, you know, hey, man. We could go more into it. But uh, this was uh, some pretty good information here. You know, obviously, research for yourself, but you brothers already know, obviously, that Isaiah wrote the whole book. We're just going to show you that these scholars uh, do be going off, man. So we got to use wisdom. All right. <coughs> yeah, there's a lot more in here, but I'm not going to read all of this. Obviously, this is a lot. All right. But he basically goes on to say that, you know, the Jews... I'll read this part. What value would such a scroll have and why would the Jews of old have any reference for their holy writings if such a cavalier attitude existed toward the prophetic writings? 
Right. And basically the way these scholars say, well, you know, the, the book was just whipped together. Anonymous dude popped up out of nowhere and just, you know, like a collage that a, that a child did. They just, you know, added some here, added some there. But we know that our forefathers, they took this serious. So if the book is called the book of Isaiah, then it had to be written by Isaiah. There's no getting around it. Yeah. So he actually he, he brings up a good point here. All right. Many died because they had such a reverence for their scriptures. Were they gullible fools? Is everyone a gullible fool except the modern scholar? <laughs> you see, of whom is Isaiah writing, whom he says, Woe to them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. That's Isaiah 55 and 21. So, yeah, the, the modern day scholars, they look at everybody else as an, ign as an ignoramus and they're the ultimate authority because they say so. <laughs> because... They can't, in their carnal mind, make sense of a miracle because a prophecy is a miracle. A prophecy is something uh, is, is the future being told, which to them in their carnal mind is impossible because they don't have any faith at all. All right. Yes, so Micah mentions um, the prophecy of uh, the Lord being born in Bethlehem. All right, so where does their line of you know reasoning end? It just keeps going and going. So, anyways, you know I happen to go through all of this. There's a lot of great information in here, okay? But uh, pretty much, man, we got to understand the, the Holy Scriptures through faith, through the Spirit of Yahweh by Hashem Shai. And that's why it's good for us to study and go into these things in these different accounts. Okay? Because ultimately, the Lord shows us prophecies so that when it comes to pass, we know that he did it. Okay? And we can get that and we can close out in that. What's that? Uh, Jeremiah 28, I think it is. It says, Jeremiah 28. And eight, the prophets that prophesy, the prophets that have been before me and before thee of old prophesy both against many countries and against great kingdoms of war and of evil and of pestilence. The prophet which prophesieth of peace, when the word of the prophet shall come to pass, then shall the prophet be known that Yahweh hath truly sent him. You see, so the prophet which prophesieth of peace. So this is against Hananiah at the time was a false prophet. All right. He was coming against what I, uh, Jeremiah was saying. So basically, the point being, though, that, you know, when prophecies come to pass, that's when it would be known that the prophet was truly a prophet. So there's many prophecies in the book of Isaiah and in the Holy Scriptures in general that have come to pass. Elijah had a prophecy about um, how Jezebel would perish and it came to pass. And the scriptures acknowledge that. So there's prophecies that have already come to pass. Let me see if I could grab that. We could close out with that. Isaiah 43, I think it is. Let's see. Let's see. Or it might be 42. Let's see. Or is it 41? Yep. Isaiah 41 and 26. Who hath declared from the beginning that we may know, and before time that we may say, He is righteous? Yea, there is none that sheweth. Yea, there is none that declareth. Yea, there is none that heareth your words. Okay? So the Lord declares these things, but our people don't listen. Okay? Yeah, so, you know, the scriptures are obviously prophetic. All right. And the Lord declares things. OK, before they happen. 
I'll get this one too. Isaiah 40 and 21. It says, have you not known? Have you not heard? Hath it not been told to you from the beginning? Have you not understand from the foundations of the earth? Yep. Because the Lord declares these things beforehand. Okay. And the Lord goes in in this one. All right. Talking about the nations, you know, letting you know that the nations are nothing. They're vanity. <laughs> Yeah, man, all of the things that these scholars come up with, you know, these wayward bullshit that they come up with to cast doubt, they're going to know when the missiles drop that the prophecies of Yahweh Hashem Yahweh has been declared through his hand. All right. And we're not we're, we're considered unlearned men. We didn't go to seminary school. We didn't go to none of this, but we don't need that because the Holy Spirit is dealing with us, man. Yahweh Hashem Yahweh is dealing with us to know what we know and to declare it. All right. So hey, with that. All praise, glory, and honor be unto Yahweh, Bahasham, Yahweh Shai, Bahasham, Chakwadash. Lord's will is edifying. Lord's will, I catch you on the next one. Shalom.